I won't waste my time, mourning your dad. I rather spend it with you. If you like true revenge stories, you found the best place for your vengeful needs. We start off with a stepmom, who doesn't waste time mourning the loss of her husband, and aims her desire towards her stepson. The stepson responds, by gifting her homelessness. Next story is as beautiful as it gets. Getting paid $60,000, to get back at an evil woman, who took advantage of a kind old lady. Last story shows, when you push one to the end of their ledge, don't be surprised, when they come back at you. Ask the like button, to lend its car for a day. But when you return it, don't fill it up with gas. Warning! These revenge stories, might be disturbing to self-entitled family members. Until now, Reddit has just been my guilty morning coffee read. But after reading some stories on entitled parents, I had to create an account to share this story. So here it goes. I'm an only son. My mom passed of ovarian cancer at only 55 five years ago. It broke my dad's heart. They had been together since college and were the same age, with my dad being a month older. So this is when the main events start to occur. I'm 22, and about to graduate college with my degree in chemistry. I went to college on a full ride scholarship. This is important later. My dad met my now stepmom, when she was my mom's nurse at the hospital, where she spent her final days. My stepmom, Grace, played all the right notes to gain my dad's trust. She was empathetic to him, nurturing, comforting after my mom passed. I was 17 and old enough to sense, that she was just trying to weasel her way into getting my dad's resources, but it was up to my dad if he wanted to be in a relationship with her. I was in my final year of public school, and had just won a scholarship to attend college out of the country, the following year. My dad mourned my mom for a year, and that whole time, Grace would check in on him by phone every month or so. In my opinion, to scope out the possibility of sinking her hooks in him. After a year passed, Grace took the gloves off and went hard after my dad. Grace was only 40 when she and my dad started seeing each other. I didn't like her, but at the same time my dad at least didn't seem so depressed anymore. So I tried to be less pessimistic about her, and give her the benefit of the doubt. In my gut I didn't trust her, though. But we are Scandinavian and at least in my family, the son does not tell his father what to do, or even offer any opinion. Grace is from the Czech Republic, if you're wondering. My father was a very successful banker during his career, and amassed quite a portfolio of wealth. I'll spare you the details, but after six months of dating, Grace and my father are married. My dad never really got over my mom though, and he was getting weaker and weaker, even though he was only 57. Since his health was fading, he called me to him and asked me point blank. Boy, what do you need to set you up in this life? I told him, I don't need anything, I'm a man and can take care of myself. But what are you even talking about dad, you're going to be around for decades yet. I did remind him that he had living sisters with children, my aunts and cousins. I also reminded him that I had a full scholarship to college, so he doesn't have to worry about giving me any cash. He passed only a year later, at 59. I of course have seen lots of Hollywood movies, so I consider the conspiracy theory that maybe my dad's nurse wife poisoned him and made him sign over all his money to her. But honestly, I do not think that's what happened. Other relatives didn't like Grace either, but they knew my dad was totally in love with my mom and that her passing utterly broke him. Well long story short, my dad bequeathed his five-bedroom house to me, even though I wasn't expecting it and didn't ask for it. He gave a small endowment to each of his sisters and their children. He left about 80% of all his existing money to Grace, which amounted to several hundreds of thousands of dollars. My dad ignored my wishes, because he's generous to a fault and still gave me several tens of thousands of dollars, which were of course very useful to me. Grace tried to put on a friendly front, but I could tell she was angry as hell that she didn't get my dad's house, too. That belonged to me, and I had the legal papers to prove it. She was especially mad, because we live in an extremely upscale and trendy location, and houses are hard to come by and easily sold for massive profit. During the first few months after my dad's passing, I had the nauseating, creepy experience, of Grace trying to feel me out to see if I might be into a little relationship with her. Um, gross, and disgraceful? She still stayed at the house though, because over the last three years she had gotten used to living there, and acted like she owned it. And, even though I officially owned it, I was always away at college and only visited my dad's old house once every couple of months, and even then, it wasn't to see Grace, 
but to see my cousins who lived just a few miles away. I downplayed the fact that it was really my house, and over the months, I think Grace gradually forgot that she really had no legal right to the house. She probably believed that sooner or later, because I never asked her for any of the hundreds of thousands of my dad's dollars that she now had, that I was somehow independently wealthy, and would just give up my house to her. Only five months after my dad was in the ground, she started dating some new guy, some sleazy looking D-bag named Ivan, who was only a few years older than me. This was the moment I knew, I'd eventually hydrogen bomb this bitch. One time, when I came home from college after graduating, she and her new boyfriend were acting like I was a guest in my own house, and that they owned it. Sure. I played along. On top of that, Grace told me she gave away my PlayStation 4 to Ivan's cousin because. Let's be real now, you're too old to play with video games. I don't even know this physical piece of sorrow, and you give him my PlayStation, to give it away to some other disappointing loony fartface, who I also don't know. Okay, okay, roger that. I will confess that I quickly changed all my network passwords, that same day. I just took it and smiled, but I knew what I had to do eventually. She also said that she and Ivan were getting married because. I can't just mourn your father forever, I have to move on with life. I tell her that I graduated college and already secured employment with a local firm, and will soon find, a new place to live. She looks thrilled. Especially the part where it looks like I'll soon have a new place to live. Then in a patronizing way she tells me. You always have a place in our house though. You are welcome to stay, whenever you please. Thanks, Grace, really generous of you. But what I'm actually saying, is that I will probably have a new place in three months already. She says with even more delight. That is wonderful timing. Because I intended to go to my homeland, to have the wedding with Ivan. And afterwards, we will have our dream honeymoon. She assures me. But it's a local affair, otherwise I'd invite you, honey. And besides, I know you're so busy. I congratulate her. She asks me if I can watch the house for her. Well, how pleasant of you to ask, I can surely watch my own house. I didn't say that of course, but I did tell her I would look after the house. I consciously careful and refrain myself from saying your house. She and her D-bag fiancé who I am 100% sure is only there for Grace's money, go on their trip and I immediately watch my house, really hard. I watch after my house, so hard, that I put out advertisements and rental websites, offering to lease my house. I hire movers and have all of Grace's furniture and possessions boxed up, and put into a storage rental facility. I retain all of my parents' furniture that they had before my dad met Grace. Locks? Changed. All of them. Within days, I am inundated with dozens of inquiries regarding my amazing, furnished house, with fantastic view. I rent it out to a wonderful young family. A barrister and a school teacher wife and their two preteen children. They pay me their first and last month's rent, and sign a lease for a year. I warn them about my crazy stepmom, who thinks this is her house, but I present them with contact information to my lawyer, the same lawyer my dad retained, in case they need any assurance that I'm on the right level. I, also give my lawyer the information about the storage facility, including the fact that I generously paid four months of storage in advance, which is a whole month longer than Grace's Czech honeymoon adventure. I then found a great apartment in the city, near my new place of work. There, I met a woman in a restaurant I frequent at night after a long work day. We have been dating six months now, and are engaged to be married. Grace of course tried to shriek and cause trouble, when she realized she got kicked out of my house, but my lawyer quickly shut her mouth without me having to ever speak to her garbage face again. From what I hear, her and her trash husband left the country, and I assume they're blowing through my dad's money, and will soon be broke like chavs usually become, when they taste a little bit of what they think is the good life. So, maybe Grace will go and try to exploit some other lonely man, into giving her his money. Speaking of money, the house that I rent out is generating so much money, that I am not only able to help pay for my cousin's college, but I moved into a larger apartment of my own, together with my fiancé. I love my job but really, I could survive solely on renting my dad's old house. And to think, if Grace had only been cooler and nicer, I might have let her stay at the house, just to be a good sport. And definitely if she stayed the hell out of my room. But no, she had to act all proprietary, so I had to make her homeless as a wedding gift. Nice cozy side note. I bought another PlayStation, even though I didn't even use my old one that much. 
It didn't matter, it wasn't for grace to give away. You don't give away other people's things. You give away your own things. Which is why, I chose to kick grace out of my house. Because it's mine, and I decide, who stays there. This happened about 5 years ago. My grandma was getting old, late 80s, early 90s. She had one wish, to not die in a senior home. Easily done, as my grandpa sold some assets way back. Then invested the money and let it ride for 30 plus years, he never touched it and collected a pension. Way back when my grandpa died, about 10 years before this, my grandma appointed my dad, this crappy aunt and my uncle, as the trustees of the trust. Basically the trusted advisors for her and her care for the foreseeable future. All was well in the beginning, then my dad, Willie, moved further away and couldn't take care of the day-to-day -day upkeep as the trustee and to check on my grandma. My aunt, Rebecca, told her that she and my uncle, Fred, who lived in Arizona, could take over and all would be fine. And it was just that, fine for a while. A few times my dad went back to visit and noticed, my grandma didn't always have overnight care, or that her mail wasn't picked up and the driveway wasn't plowed. She also lost her cable TV and newspaper subscription. My dad figured it just lapsed, so he had the services put back on. My dad also noticed my grandma was eating moldy food at times. Because her truck was sold and she had no transportation, she drove up to 90 years old. She basically just chilled at the house alone and did crossword puzzles. The craziest part of this, is that my aunt only lived two miles from my grandma, but my grandma told my dad, she saw Aunt Rebecca once a week on Saturday, for about one hour. As with the elderly in age, my grandma passed away. She did get her wish and was able to die in her own home. Upon her passing, things started to get real interesting. Once the probate lawyer got her children, my dad, aunt, uncle and another estranged aunt, Becky, around the table, some shady business started to come out. My aunt Rebecca, asked that everyone just forego any audit or paperwork and they just sell the house, for around $400,000, and divide, up the remaining bank account balance of roughly $400,000. So just signing on the line, each sibling was to get a check for $200,000, not too bad of an inheritance. But my dad thought that was somewhat rushed. He said at the time that he wanted to wait, because my grandma's house was easily in the $600,000 range, based on size and location. My aunt exploded in his face, cursing at him and calling him all kinds of names, because he was unwilling to sign the assets then and there. She basically wanted a quick close, while everyone looked the other way. My dad ended up leaving the room after the screaming, and the deal wasn't signed that day. It took nearly six months before another appointment, and they were all back at the table. The thing is though, when you are a trustee and the person dies, the funds and access to financial accounts are all under heavy scrutiny, until all beneficiaries are made aware and sign the final papers. At the next meeting, my dad went in there with no intention to sign the deal. He got his brother, my uncle Fred, to agree that they audit the entire accounts, going back five years. When they demanded this at the second meeting, with the lawyer present, my aunt ended up arguing. A forensic audit will cost $5,000 and it's a waste. Like what difference does it make? But as two beneficiaries requested it, it would happen either way. The audit report showed up about three months later. Here, is where it gets good. My dad began looking over the audit report and saw it was full of holes, like excessive monthly food costs for a 90-year-old lady. Payments made for car services for a car my grandma no longer had. Many different things in there, that just didn't add up. My dad asked me to give the audit a second look, so I spent a Saturday night going over it, and here is some crazy stuff I found in particular. And what I alerted my dad about. Costco monthly food costs of $1,100 to $2,000, for the last four years. Telephone bills for six cell phones, grandma has a home phone only. Gasoline for a truck my grandma didn't have for like four years, and easily up to $400 per month. House repairs paid to my aunt's husband who owned a construction business. Some of the house repairs were like $16,000. Like for a new roof, new garage doors, home security system, which she didn't have, and more. These services were charged at inflated prices too. This is not all. Grandma paid for my aunt, to go to Europe twice on a luxury vacation. My grandma was paying my estranged aunt Becky, a stipend of $2,000 a month for the last five years, as well as her deadbeat son for a generous $2,500. Every month, they were paid handsomely. All grandkids were to be paid a lump sum of $10,000 upon their 30th birthday, 
as that is when the $50 check from grandma stopped for all grandkids. Guess who was paid out, her kids and my estranged aunt's kids, but not me or my siblings. My grandma gave loans to my aunt Rebecca for her husband's construction business, in return for equity in the company, which amounted to nothing. These loans totaled about $200,000 over three years, right around when the housing bust happened. They also sold her assets like jewelry and whatnot for cash, because some big ticket items simply vanished from her house. Armed with all this, the next probate meeting was going to be interesting at least. In the time between my grandma's death, and the third probate meeting, my aunt's construction business filed for bankruptcy. So that $200,000 in equity grandma had, simply vanished. The probate lawyer was also somewhat concerned, and makes it obvious that this was fraud and breach of fiduciary duty, where my aunt could actually get real prison time. After this, the negotiations were much more, favorable. My aunt got nothing, literally zero, my other aunt only received $25,000 after all the stipend payments. My father and uncle shared the rest, after all grandkids, received the $10,000 payout. The house sold to the first offer for $520,000. That was the regular revenge, for any treacherous bitch that ripped off grandma and had her eating moldy food. Here is when the revenge, took a professional turn. My aunt probably felt pretty bad, that she couldn't supplement her lifestyle with grandma's money anymore, but that was the least of her worries. Since she tried to personally rip me off for $10,000, I took it personally. I don't care how tough you are, the IRS is the scariest thing that can happen to a person, nobody wants to have their money forcibly removed. I did a little research and found the 3949A form. I also had the audit and the legal office would provide the full trust in requested, demanded by the IRS, I don't know if it ever was. So I photocopied my documents, then notarized it and send the info off to the IRS. After, I felt like it went nowhere. Then maybe 18 months later, I was notified and asked to come to the IRS building for an appointment in my city. The agent went over all the details, specifically what they found in their research, and then they asked for a sworn statement from my side. It turns out, my aunt didn't declare around $1.2 million in additional income over five years, and as such, she owed the IRS around $420,000 plus penalties. There was no way she was going to pay that on a teacher's pension, and after her husband bankrupts his business. Her house was sold, her vehicles sold, and they left the state. Now aunt and uncle live in a depressing desert town in the southwest. The IRS paid me around $60,000 about three months after the appointment. She should have paid that $10,000, and gotten fresh bread for my grandma. This story is told from the female perspective. This happened back in 2010, when I lived in Winter Garden, Florida, with my husband and his dying uncle. For you to understand the story, I will start with some background. My husband and I moved in with his sick uncle, after losing so much during the 2008 housing market crash. We lived together in a condo, because his uncle had stage 4 cirrhosis of the liver, and his self-entitled sister and her family refused to help take care of him. My husband is a retired Seminole County Sheriff's officer, important later. We got ourselves set in the condo's two bedrooms, as his uncle had himself set up in the living room including his bed. On the first day, we found dangerous black mold caused by a leaky dishwasher. On the second day, we found the master shower had loose tiles and a leaky shower head. On the third day, we found a nest of brown recluse spiders in the living room. We talked with our uncle about these problems and found out that the slumlord is friends with our self-entitled aunt and her family. When we updated him on the situation, he was refusing to take care of the issues, as required by law. We wanted to start legal actions then, but my husband's uncle talked us out of it several times. The slumlord had always been nice to us. Until our uncle passed. After my husband's uncle died, it was a completely different story. The slumlord had turned nasty, aggressive, and began to try and strong arm evict us, like we were nothing more than addicted squatters. Slumlord even bowed up and aggressively tried to fight my husband, when we dropped off our next rent check. He kept telling us that we had to move, or else, but yet refused to follow actual Florida laws to evict us. The slumlord and his wife, get in contact with our awful aunt and equally awful uncle, and recruit them to breathe in our necks. Self-entitled aunt plainly told us, just move, even if you have to live in a tent. Or at least move, so they can rent it out to another senior who actually needs it. My husband replied, 
We don't have anywhere else to go yet, and he must go through eviction laws or he'll get into serious trouble. Self-entitled aunt. You're nothing but trouble. You've been a pain since the day you were born. Get out of their condo and stop being a problem for everyone. Who cares if you have to live in a tent? Why would she keep emphasizing for us to go live in a tent? My husband was a retired SCSD officer who specialized in uncovering corrupted law enforcement, and this situation made him suspicious. We talked about the situation and started our protection plan. My first order was to place all rent into escrow, with evidence of repairs that have been neglected. Second, I sent a notification of cease and desist of harassment to the slumlord and the self-entitled aunt. Next, I researched public property tax records. Woohoo! Hey dirt there! Slumlord's condo wasn't registered as a rental property with the state of Florida, and was paying far less in property taxes than he should have been paying. Property tax records also showed, that Slumlord did not own the condo. It was still deeded to his mother, which I found out had been living in a retirement home for five years, before my husband's uncle moved in. My husband found out, that his wife was responsible for inspecting properties against Florida Code Enforcement Conduct Laws. She was the one responsible for inspecting Slumlord's properties, and signed it off, including the condo we were living in. This is against Florida Code Enforcement Conduct Laws. I found out from the condo neighbors, that the Slumlord had only been renting to seniors with severe health issues. My best discovery next to tax evasion, was finding out that the Condo Owners Association had a very strict no renting slash leasing policy, meaning you, or family, had to live in the condo and it couldn't be rented. The, revenge, now that we had all of our evidence, my husband and I, began to knock down all of the slumlord's dominoes. My husband went and filed a complaint with the Winter Garden authorities about the corrupt code enforcement activities, and the wife's perjuring inspections on her family properties. My husband has a glowing record in Seminole County and with the FDLE, for having over 200 clean arrests and taking down nearly 60 corrupt public officials, including child protective services in the early 2000s. This background helped push WGPD to open an investigation. They discovered that not only had she perjured inspections on her family's properties, but also on my husband's self-entitled aunt and uncle's property as well. This explained her involvement in the matter, and why she was so eager to get involved. This got the wife of the slumlord fired, stripped of her state enforcement license, and convicted of multiple crimes. I sent all property tax fraud evidence to the Florida's property tax division. That got the state to investigate the slumlord. The state found that not only did he commit property tax fraud on the condo, but also on a property that he was renting to his son and self-entitled aunt's son, along with business tax fraud and income tax fraud. When investigators came to the rental houses of both slumlord's son and self-entitled aunt's son, they were for possession of illegal narcotics, with intent to sell. I never expected that much fraud to be found from all of this, but I'm glad it happened. The business tax fraud of the slumlord affected self-entitled aunt, and her equally self-entitled brother as well, since they were his business partners. Self-entitled uncle came under investigation by the USPS board, as he was the postmaster of Winter Garden. Self-entitled uncle lost his comfy job and pension, after it was discovered how he was assisting slumlord in the tax fraud scam, and for stealing money orders. All four were, convicted of multiple white-collar crimes, had to sell their properties and most of their stuff, serve some form of time, and pay huge amounts of fines and restitution. Slumlord, his wife, hubby's self-entitled aunt, and hubby's self-entitled uncle, along with their sons, all went down for multiple crimes. Both felonies and misdemeanors, all because they thought they could strong-arm evict us. Just proves how smart tenants can really be when pushed. Also proves, why everyone should know all rental laws and how to research public records, because it can save you in the end. Did you get any reaction out of them? Just curious, I'd love to hear it. Self-entitled aunt and uncle disown my husband afterwards because of it, according to my hubby's other nicer aunt. She also told the self-entitled aunt, that they couldn't live with her in her farmhouse, whereas we have an open invitation for the rest of our lives. While it is a great story, and I love seeing karma make the rounds, I do have a question. Didn't you, in effect, hurt yourselves, so to speak? By making this so public. It seems you have to move out quicker than you would have by keeping quiet. The condo will probably be sold to recoup legal bills. The HOA won't let you stay, as you are renters. What are your plans now? 
It seems like some of the fallout from this nuclear revenge fell smack onto you. I loved your story, but what are you going to do now? Actually, by the time we turned them in, we already were set on moving. Collecting evidence can take a while, and it's easy enough to line up other living arrangements. We moved in 2010, while the state did their work on the slumlord. Also, you can talk to a Hoa or Koa, without revealing that you're a renter, but I did it the day we literally moved. Been living in Ohio, since the slumlord and bandit crew got manhandled by state and federal justice system. <laughs> you stayed till the end, which means you're the one I make these episodes for. Thank you for your support, I really appreciate you. Subscribe, so you don't miss out on future episodes and show your vengeful devotion, by tickling the like button without mercy. Do you have any experiences surrounding the topic of this episode? Share yours below, I'll join the conversation. I'll be seeing you, in the next one. Remember that these stories are shared for your entertainment. This content is to be taken as such, and nothing else. Royal AI, rejects advocation or instigation of illegal actions.